วัสดีค่ะ Once again, I'm back here with you for the live interviews with experts, finding out the latest in HIV research and treatment, and much, much more as part of the 19th Bangkok International Symposium on HIV Medicine. I'm Pachuri Raksa Wong, being joined here by Dr. Eugene Kroon, research physician at CERT at the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center. Right. So, what is it? Your Thai is excellent. Occasionally. But, but we're going to stick to English. Thank you. Because the guest joining us does not speak Thai, or does he? He does not. He does not. So we will stick to English, and we do have an audience here joining us live all over the world. Wonderful. That's um, so. We're going to start right right away with Professor Victor Valcour. He's from the Division of Geriatric Medicine and the Department of Neurology Consultant for Memory and Aging Center, Sandler Neurosciences Center at the University of California, USA. Is that complete? Yes. Perfect. Thank Good. you okay, Victor. for joining us, Absolutely. flying here to Bangkok from all the way over there in the USA. It's fantastic. I've been coming here for 15 years and love it every time. Great. Great to hear that. Now let's go right into the questions here. We're going to be focusing on neurocognitive functionality in people aging. People aging, what's the definition there in older, old people? Well, that's a very good question. I think it changes a lot depending on who you're talking to mm. and who the group is that you're studying, who you have available. Uh, I think classically in HIV, they defined it as over 50, which is really particularly problematic this year because I turned 50 and oh. I don't feel that it's anywhere near being old. And uh, it's really <laughs> perhaps even in middle age. But in the HIV population, it really was the oldest group of people for the longest time. And I think the number is moving up. Uh, mm -hmm. We're now studying people over 60 and even into 65, starting to think about really a truly geriatric population that's living with HIV. Mm -hmm. And it's not uncommon for me to see people who are 80, 85 years of age, living with this uh, virus as a chronic illness. So I think the numbers have moved quite mm -hmm. a bit over the years and, and will probably continue to move further and further up. And that's as people fantastic live to a hear. Long time mm -hmm. with, this, with this virus. Great, great. Dr. Velcor, your topic this afternoon will cover frailty. Mm. What does frailty mean in this context yeah. and how is it helpful? Yeah, well that's a great question as well. I'm not sure it's terribly helpful. Uh, I first learned about frailty when I was training in geriatric medicine and the concept was how do you measure vulnerability in people when you've got controlled for all of the illnesses that they have, all of the diseases that they have? Mm -hmm. How do you understand who is most vulnerable for bad outcomes? And this concept of frailty uh, was born really in people over 80 years of age who, in, in my language, I would say had the dwindles. They just weren't doing well. They didn't have good outcomes when they're hospitalized. Mm -hmm. And so we started to measure, really, uh, measures of individuals that could predict who's not going to do well, hand strength and how fast they can walk and uh, some physical attributes. In the HIV population, it hasn't proven to be great yet. Uh, people have studied it. The frequency of true frailty is, is, is rare, in, I would say, or not common anyways in HIV. And, and what we see instead are people with multiple illnesses that are intersecting. And so I prefer you know, examining multimorbidity and how these diseases interact with each other to predict outcomes. People have done a much better job with that and, and done, uh, had been more, have been more favorably predictive of some outcomes than using this frailty measure. So although it's a great word and people have a sense of what it means, mm -hmm. in the scientific context it hasn't proven to be so valuable, uh, oh. particularly in this HIV population. Interesting. Thank you. Then basically uh, you relate frailty also to neurocognitive functioning. Um, neurocognitive functioning. How do you distinguish a decline in neurocognitive functioning in people with HIV from other forms, especially in the aging population, right. from other forms of dementia that we're more familiar with, yeah. like Alzheimer's? I, I like to say that this is one of the most uh, important geriatric neuro-HIV questions that we have because we've not before had a population that was in an age range where Alzheimer's disease is a likely cause for mm -hmm. the cognitive impairment. It doesn't happen often in 50 or 60 year olds that they have Alzheimer's disease, even in HIV negative populations. But now as we have people who are 70, and I'll present a case this afternoon of somebody I was really challenged, who has a first degree relative with Alzheimer's disease, was presenting with some memory problems, 
um, and had HIV, and I was convinced this person had Alzheimer's disease, yet we have no tests to really do de determine the two from each other. So there, there's a lot of work. I think it's one of the most pressing issues we have now for a truly aging population is how are we going to distinguish these two? Mm. Yet there's a lot of hope as well because a lot of the imaging work that we do and a lot of the cognitive measures that we mm. use are probably going to be uh, very helpful. Where we need to get is from the, the diagnostics of what we call HIV-related impairment to a guideline that would distinguish the two. One thing this audience may not know that e is that even with treatment, about 50% of people living with HIV will have some degree of cognitive challenge. Mm. Not a dementia, not an advanced cognitive problem, but an inefficiency that makes them not feel like they're doing as well as they should. And it's measurable, and we know that it correlates with the amount of inflammation from the virus. So it's real. So if you're working with a population that has such a high frequency of cognitive impairment, how will you know if they have a second disease like Alzheimer's yeah. disease? It's a real challenge that we so need to deal with. This particular yeah. subject, how did you approach it? Well, we used all of the measures that we have, including imaging, which looked rather okay for this individual. We looked at cognitive panels and found that the test that he was not doing well on uh, didn't quite match with HIV. So we really were worried that this might be something separate. But in a research environment where I work, we had the capability of looking for the protein that causes Alzheimer's disease. And we did this very expensive, fancy scan and found out that indeed he did not. But that's not available for most people. So in, in my language, we would call it a phenocopy. It looked like Alzheimer's, but it was not Alzheimer's. It was in fact caused by HIV. So it, it, it made it even more confusing for us in this individual who was relieved that we were able to give that information. But it's, sim it's not even available in my environment to do that for everybody. But uh, it's certainly somewhere we need to get. Were you able to optimize anything about his treatment? And, and actually, I'm really sad you asked the question now because you gave away one of my questions <laughs> to the audience. If there's anyone in the audience, you now know the answer to the question. So, sorry. My pleasure. <laughs> All right, then. Well, we thank you so yeah, very much for so taking much. the thank time. You. Thank you. And I know the audience look forward to your presentation later on. Fantastic. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank good you. Afternoon. Once again, that was Professor Victor Valcour joining us yeah, in the Division of Geriatric <laughs> Medicine and the Department of Neurology, Neurology Consultant for Memory and Aging Center, Sandler Neurosciences Center, University of California. We are going to continue with our live interviews here next. Next, we are going to be focusing on co- and multi-morbidity in people aging with HIV. Actually, Professor Valcourt brought that up a little bit in yes, his um, talk just now. Our next guest, we have Professor Peter Wrights. He is going to be joining us from the Department of Global Health, Academic Medical Center, and Amsterdam Oops. Institute of Global Health and Development from the Netherlands. So what nice to see you. He's already here. here. <laughs> so nice to Hello, see you. Lovely, Lovely to have you here. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Good to have you. Professor Rice, uh, to start with a question then, uh, Professor Velcourt just said he considers people over 50 to be aging with HIV. Would you agree with that definition? I, I don't know. I guess I would say that it depends on how a person feels him <laughs> or herself. Because At least that applies to me. Okay. <laughs> I was, was leading up to my next question. <laughs> what proportion of people with HIV are aging? So and then you have to make a cut off somewhere, mm. I guess. Yeah, well, I think internationally, if you look at the WHO, people put the cutoff at, at 50. But of course, what I meant is that it's sort of artificial. Yeah. But you need to put it somewhere and have a consistent number so that people can compare between studies. So if we put it at 50, what are we looking at of the HIV-infected population? In the sense with? of the number of yes. people. Well, I think it's a, it's a growing number. It depends on which part of the world you look at. Mm -hmm. In my own country, in the Netherlands, it's a substantial proportion. I always forget the numbers, exact numbers, but it's like 40 to 50 percent that it's are over 50. And the projections are, fortunately in a way, yeah. that that proportion will only grow. And that's really a result of the success of our treatment. And, and elsewhere in the world, if you look at the UNAIDS figures, it's growing numbers of people. Again, a reflection of the rollout of treatment. And we understand you manage one of the most well-established cohorts of people aging with HIV right now. So in that context, has anything changed over the years the cohort has been ongoing? And what, are the, what do you perceive currently as the most pressing issues for people aging with HIV? Well, I mean, the cohort, we set it up because there were a lot of... Uh, rumors going around about issues like accelerated or premature aging and there were really no data. 
So one of the we had the opportunity to set up the cohort and, and decided we needed to start somewhere uh, and, and really get data and also be able to compare that to a group of people without, without HIV. The cohort, as you said, it's ongoing. Mm -hmm. People entering the cohort, which is something that, that Dr. Velker also alluded to, are at a median age of like 52 years. Mm -hmm. So we have the proportion of people who are, let's say, in their 70s is mm -hmm. still small. Okay. So I think the, the conclusions that we draw will, will probably change as we, as we follow people longer. Uh, so far, we've looked at uh, people over two, sometimes for some issues over four years. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I, it's hard to generalize, but I would say on the optimistic side, the amount of change that we see over such a short period of time is fairly limited, which is good news. Very good news. Yeah. What do you see, though? If you do identify issues, well, what, what you, are what they? What you do see, one of the things that I'll be speaking about is that, that you see that people uh, with HIV have more multiple morbidities so if you if you compare the two groups mm -hmm. people who have like three or more diseases at the same time aside from their HIV that's something that is more frequent even in their mid 50s for people with HIV than people with HIV. but these diseases as such these morbidities as such are the same as in the general population we're talking yes so they're more prevalent heart but disease, it's but heart disease uh, metabolic bone disease uh, chronic kidney disease really across the board and, and diseases that unfortunately we see more commonly as we all age. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the cohort as such? How large is it? Uh, how many are we having similar cohorts in Thailand and other places in the world where disease patterns may be different as people age? Because yeah, I understand that also in Africa the population with HIV is aging here right. in Thailand as well? Right. Well, well, I think it's a good point. So I, I, I don't think you should necessarily uh, extrapolate what we find in the mm -hmm. Netherlands to other parts of the world. So I think you're making a good point that the study should be done. The one thing, I mean, we, we decided to do and had the opportunity to do a very comprehensive study with very comprehensive assessment. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very time consuming. Yeah. Uh, not just for the investigators, but also for the participants. So you also need to look, I mean, in the setting in Bangkok that you have here, I would say, you are in the situation where you could probably do it just as sophisticated as we do. Africa, certain mm -hmm. settings, yes, yes, you could, but not everywhere. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I, I don't think you necessarily need to do it in the same way. So the, the size, you asked about the size, it's about 500 participants in both of the groups and of course if you want to do in-depth studies with a lot of uh, studies on, on uh, biological specimens blood samples urine samples that you get from these people you can't do it in tens of thousands of people uh, but if you want to look at clinical data like for mm -hmm. instance heart disease eventually you, you'll have to look in much larger groups of people and follow them for a long period of time so that's a challenge because where do you find the funding to actually do that? But I think ultimately, uh, if people collect basic information over a long period of time in many places of the world and put data sets together, we'll get some answers. Yes. We do have question. time, Wonderful. yes, please. Then, uh, basically, I was thinking um, 500 people. That's sufficient a size to, to get the answers you need. If you look at the drugs we had in the past, they were quite toxic yeah. compared to what we have now. Yeah. How do you separate what are long-term side effects from the drugs these people have been on for a while versus aging effects, HIV? Yeah, How do you approach that? Well, that's a very, that's a very good question. So, um, of course, these people, uh, the people in the cohort who have HIV have, are a mix. So it, it is, it's a mix of people who actually have been exposed to these old drugs and mm -hmm. are on modern regimen. It's also people who started right away on the modern regimen. Okay. And you, by using statistical approaches, you try to tease out. But I don't think you get any black and white answer. And we, we're getting some hints that, that the older drugs may still have effects still today. But I think the, the, the other point I'll try to make this afternoon is that you, you can't generalize across the board. So what, what we find for one comorbidity may be across the board for all comorbidities, but not necessarily so. 
So you have to look one by one. And, uh, and, and, and another thing which may be good news is that certainly it's, it's not the case that having been exposed to the old drugs is bad for everything. Okay. For some issues, yes, blood pressure is one, but not necessarily for everything. And, but clearly also for overall survival. They're still with and us today, that's a great benefit. Well, ex yeah. well that's, that's, that's true, and that's also, in other words, you're, you're also looking at a selected population. Yeah. It is the people yeah. who manage to survive, true. and what you'll never know is whether they are special, special in, in some way. sense compared to the people who are unfortunately no longer with us. Very interesting point. Yes. Right. Thank you so very much for joining us today. You're very welcome. Professor Peter Professor Rice. Rice. I'll be leaving this year. Okay. from the Department of Global Health Academic Medical Center and Amsterdam Institute of Global Health Development. And we also thank you as well, Dr. My Eugene pleasure. Kroon. Thank you very much indeed. And that wraps up the first two discussions with our experts. We do have more guests joining us, and I have another co-host joining me at this point, too. I'd like to welcome Dr. Denise Chu, a research physician at CERT at the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center. So, Adika, thank you very Adika. much for joining me here. Now, um, we're going to go straight into the next topic. We'll be talking about opportunistic infections and immune activation. And we are going to be joined by Ms. Irini Seretti from the National Institutes of Health of the United States of America. So, Adika, do join us. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. All right, over to you then, Dr. Denise Chu. Okay, so Irini, it was very interesting in your presentation that you mentioned there is actually not a lot of data on the opportunities for cure in patients who've had opportunistic infection or who presented late. So how do you suggest for us to generate more data or more knowledge in this area? Right, so I, I was actually also very surprised when I started looking in the literature, it was um, amazing how vast majority of people living with HIV infection have actually um, di were diagnosed mm -hmm. with advanced disease, some of them with opportunistic infection, and yet there are no data on the impact uh, of these uh, clinical phenomena on uh, HIV reservoir. So I think there are two ways to approach this, um, uh, this issue. Uh, the first is uh, that uh, it will be very important in, in pathogenesis studies or basic science studies that are looking at samples from HIV infected persons, uh, it would be very important to include in their, in their manuscripts uh, a very detailed clinical history of the participants, of the study participants. So it's interesting you go and you read a paper and you can read every detail about the HIV reservoir and the methods that are used and yet when you go to the uh, clinical characteristics of the participants you cannot see whether they had an opportunistic infection or a co-infection uh, at the time that they were actually studied. Uh, so I think th there should be uh, more of an effort uh, to get a more detailed clinical history and of, of the background uh, clinical history of these uh, study participants. The second one is I think uh, looking into the future, I think there should be more dedicated studies uh, looking specifically at um, patients who have been diagnosed late and who presented with an opportunistic infection and have a sort of more um, uh, studies designated to address the questions of uh, HIV compartmentalization and res tissue reservoirs uh, and how uh, the findings of uh, particular subgroups uh, of these patients can have an impact on future remission or cure uh, strategies. So I would love to see an initiative to um, uh, specifically address the question of how do uh, certain co-infections and the treatment of co-infections um, affect uh, the HIV reservoirs. Right. Let's go into the topic here, opportunistic infections and immune activation that you are focusing on and you already delivered your presentation inside there. Let's talk about um, the causes and the prevention there. Uh, the causes and the of the causes as well as prevention, treatment, prevention. as we go o overall picture here for our viewers joining us. Absolutely. Um, so I think 
as everybody, every other speaker mentioned in this session, it is very important to put a lot of effort in diagnosing HIV early mm -hmm. and treating early in order to uh, avoid the destruction of the immune system and the opportunistic infections. Uh, so I think uh, the best way to prevent that would be to um, diagnose early and treat uh, early. Now, for, for those people who were not diagnosed early and were treated late, um, I think initiation of treatment as soon as the diagnosis is made is also a very important um, treatment modality that uh, should be um, applied. Um, All right. Are there particular opportunistic infections that you think Thai healthcare providers should be especially aware of? Um, I think tuberculosis is obviously mm. a very important opportunity infection in this area as well as in uh, other areas. Um, uh, cryptococcus I think is also important, histoplasmosis, so some of the opportunistic infections that have to do with um, uh, a pneumocystis pneumonia, so I think both fungal infections and tuberculosis uh, should definitely be high on the radar. Um, and although it's not traditionally an opportunistic infection, I think hepatitis B uh, is also very important and um, it, it would be very important to following this area. What are some other key points or messages which you would like to get across to the audience joining us here um, at our conference here as well as online there? This is real-time live streaming. Okay, sure. Um, so I think it is important to acknowledge uh, that a lot of the HIV diagnosis are made late uh, mm. and some of the uh, persons that infected with HIV have opportunistic infections or co-infections. Um, I think uh, uh, persons infected with HIV and co-infections or opportunistic infections, um, it should volunteer also for research uh, because we um, there's very important knowledge uh, to be gained by studying specifically uh, the patients who also have other infections mm -hmm. uh, and opportunistic infections. A unique opportunity is also the fact that um, a lot of these uh, HIV-infected persons with infections um, get a lot of procedures done for clinical purposes, and um, it's really a, a, a very good opportunity to perhaps combine a research and clinical care by using some of these collected uh, samples um, for, for research. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there can be a lymph node biopsy that is done for diagnosis of lymphadenopathy, for example, or lumbar puncture done for collection of uh, lumbar fluid uh, mm -hmm. to diagnose an infection. I think uh, some of these specimens could potentially also be used for research that would be extremely helpful to understand better how these infections may affect um, the seeding of the HIV in the different tissue compartments in uh, patients with co-infections. We would all have to agree that research is so extremely important to move forward, but of course there are some challenges. Like you said, it is rather difficult sometimes to find volunteers or people to join in with the research programs. Any other challenges? I think the, the challenge in, um, in patients presenting late and with opportunistic infection is uh, uh, certainly that they're not going to be sort of the frontline candidates for cure strategies. Mm -hmm. um, these are people who were diagnosed with very low um, CD4 counts, uh -huh. and um, since analytic treatment interruption is part of a lot of the cure strategies, um, they would be sort of considered high risk uh, for sort of the frontline um, interventions that we might be looking at for cure or remission strategies. Uh, but on the other hand, I think uh, participation in, in uh, basic science and uh, research that can be done to understand better how um, the virus is spread in the setting of other co-infections or treatment of the co-infections and what could be the effect of treating the co-infections on the HIV seeding and the establishment of different tissue reservoirs. I think uh, that will give us very important knowledge to be able to design future strategies that could be uh, perhaps a spin-off of existing cure strategies or perhaps designated mm. uh, for people who have mm. co-infections mm. or had a co-infection or an opportunistic infection in the past. And coming back to the first question you raised about data, that is extremely important. We're going to actually have a session on the evolution of data um, mm -hmm. coming up in a short while from now. But for now, I'd like to thank you so very thank much you. for sparing the time coming in to talk to us and giving us the latest here, Irini Seretti. And um, we have to also thank you as well, Dr. Denise Chu, for playing my co-host for this segment. 
thank you very much to the both of you and enjoy the rest of the material being presented in the conference rooms. Thank, thank you, you once so again. Thank you very much. We continue here with three more very interesting topics and I know that you're looking forward to the next guests coming in to share the latest in, in updates and information and yes you are right on time. I'd like to welcome back a familiar face now because you were here with us yesterday as well. We are joined now by Dr. Tosa Purata researcher and pediatrician at HIVNAT of the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center. So what the car I'm very happy you're back here yeah, with me again, me Dr. Tosak. Oh, yeah. I'm very happy that you're happy too to be <laughs> back here under the spotlight. Okay, let's move on then. We are now going to be talking about cognitive and mental health evaluation. We haven't talked much about, about neuro and mental health. Correct, and, and that's something we haven't really talked about, yeah. have we? So we're going to go right into that and bring up on stage Professor Claude and Melins. I hope I have pronounced that correct, from Columbia University, New York. Sawadika. Thank you very much for joining us, Professor. I'm going to leave the questions to you, Dr. Tosa. Yeah. No. At, at the beginning, you can ask the general questions from like because you are a, ma a mother. Yes. You can ask about like what is the test or how can how can we evaluate the children? There you go. Center. He's asked it for me. <laughs> how do we go about evaluating mental health in a child? Because yes, I'm a mother. He says, and he knows I've got my son running around after school, joining us later. If you hear a child screaming, that's him. <laughs> Well, first of all, it is an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Um, and I can relate to you as uh, a mother of three boys oh, who are a little bit older, running three around boys. doing all of this. Right. Um, so mental health, I think, as you've heard maybe through some of this meeting, is one of the most significant um, things that are happening for young people and children who, mm -hmm. are, who have grown up with HIV. Mm -hmm. And so we have a range of measures that we can use. Um, to assess how they're doing in terms of depression, in terms of anxiety, in terms of how they cope um, with stress and difficult situations. And we can also look at how they function cognitively, how their brain's working, how they learn, how they do in school, what their memory is like, how they plan, um, all these things that are very important for becoming a young person and then becoming an adult. adult. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have the, the study together mm -hmm. uh, in, in Thailand and in Cambodia. Could you tell us about uh, the project? Um, so we have a study um, that Dr. Uh, Jintanat is overseeing here called Resilience. And this study is so important because most people have looked at children and adolescents growing up with HIV and they focused on just bad outcomes, you know, the behavioral difficulties they're having or the poor cognitive problems they're having. But she very wisely wanted to focus on who's doing well and who's resilient because it's those kids who really can tell us how to help those who are struggling. So this study is focused on resilience and it's looking at the impact of HIV on the brain, on cognitive function, and on mental health. And then for adolescents, what's really important is whether or not they're taking their medicines whether or not they're yet experimenting with alcohol or other kinds of drugs and whether or not they're engaged in sexual risk behavior. So this study um, that, very that beneficial Dr. Korsak is, yeah, is leading. This, this issue is very important for our patients because uh, if you have some depression or some mental health, it's effect to uh, the treatment outcome. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we found in, in adolescents and adults is that if young people have mental health problems, they are less likely to take their medicines. Mm -hmm. They may engage in risk behaviors that are bad for their health and also that have public health concerns. Right. Now, this is definitely an aspect we have not really looked into so far until this point. And as you mentioned, it is extremely key because uh, peer support and, 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 and the, uh, the general family support, also, family, family, yes. yes. And I think the mass media also has an important role to play because we do need to get the word out there, the latest, and, and also in terms of support mechanism, yeah. things like that. Extremely crucial indeed. Yeah. And there's so much that we can do in terms of mental health to young, you know, mm -hmm. to help young people. 
Um, in the United States, my, my colleagues and I have developed a mental health clinic that can really be a safe, supportive environment. Um, and then there's some work we're doing here that... Yeah. Um, Do we have something done. similar to this as, as what they have uh, in the U yeah, U.S.? We have, we, have the, we found many, many problems now, and we found the... Uh, we call the IQ test mm -hmm. our patients and also the we call uh, exposed but un, but uninfected children also have the low IQ so it's very important issue so one of the things that these studies are showing is that young people who are growing up with HIV face many of the same difficulties that other kids um, in low uh, in, in places where there may be a lot of stress where there may be poverty where there may be um, parents with illnesses, they face many of the same things that can make it difficult for them. So it's not all about HIV, it's about some of these other life circumstances that can make it very hard. And, and so we're working to actually help both of those groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, beside this study, uh, Dr. Claude also have uh, the study called CHAMP. This is kind of the intervention. Could you tell us about this sure. project? So with, again, with the Thai group here, um, with funding from TreatAsia and HIVNET and, and also um, the U.S. Uh, government, um, we've been able to develop an intervention that works with families to support the family of adolescents. And these interventions really help to help parents like us communicate better with our adolescents, also supervise them and mm -hmm. monitor them so that they will be safe. And then it works with adolescents to help them feel good about themselves and to get social support. We've um, developed it for HIV positive youth in the United States and then we've taken it to Africa and then we just completed um, a clinical trial of it here in, in Thailand. Um, and we're gonna be looking at that data, but hoping that it will help kids' mental health help them take their medicines better and support families in general who mm -hmm. really need this mm -hmm. kind of help. It's really great to hear of these yeah. programs. Great. And um, we do have a bit more time here yeah, yeah. If, if there are any other interesting programs um, which... Uh, I think the, the challenging is uh, when we found how can I say, the abnormal tests or mm -hmm. abnormal mental health, we need some intervention to help to help the patient and also the family. No? Do you have any, any suggestions if you found a child with uh, like depression yeah. or, and other things, yeah. what, what can be helped? So, so one of the things, um, actually my colleague Dr. Warren and Eng and I were here also for um, consulting on mental health and what can be done across Asian countries mm -hmm. to promote mental health in youth and families. I think there are actually a lot of services that are already out mm, there, great. but things that are very helpful, there are medications for kids who are really, really struggling with significant depression and anxiety. There are medications that can be very helpful, but there are also... Um, uh, psychotherapy programs, so working with kids to help them around behavior and their thoughts and how to um, uh, work with their emotions can be very, very helpful one-on-one -on -one with a counselor. It can also help for them to have groups mm -hmm. of their peers who can support them. And then I think one of the most critical things is bringing families together so that caregivers and youth um, are being supported by other families. I think when, when people are in isolation, it's very difficult. Um, and, and so I think both one, um, assessing and finding out whether kids have cognitive or mental health problems and then having resources to provide that kind of service. What's, what's the situation here in Thailand? I mean, the, yeah. the, because culturally it's a bit yeah. different here. Uh, people are a lot more reserved and not very open. Yeah. And family as well. Sometimes they different. want to, to, to because um, they're infected. Yes. And then they hide away, they yes. shy away, and they close things together, all together. I, I, I do agree, no? yeah. because in, in the CHAMP study, uh, we adapt the cartoon. We have the cartoon, oh. like curriculum for the parents. Yeah. And so, at the beginning, it's from South Africa, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not, not matched with the Thai culture, mm -hmm. so the Asian culture. So we adjust to the Thai cartoon, then we can help. No? So these cartoons, so first of all, one of the things about the CHAMP program that's wonderful is it's not called a mental health program. Uh -huh. It's a program for families to help support their kids okay. around taking medicines um, and, and feeling better in quality of life. Right. So that kind of stigma isn't mm -hmm. there. But we created these cartoons that actually a, a father in one of the yeah, clinics yeah. drew, which was really oh. extraordinary, so that um, 
caregivers and children could talk about the cartoon characters mm -hmm. and what they were struggling with. The, the cartoon here is about a 12-year-old boy who is dealing with the loss of his father, he's dealing with his own HIV, um, and so the cartoon takes him and you, know, you learn about him, you learn about his mother, and so the stigma's not there, mm -hmm. and families can talk about him and his mother before they talk about themselves, right. and it's been really wonderful in terms of bringing families together. It's great to hear about that. Yeah injecting some positivity yeah. into their lives, into yeah. into themselves as well, giving them more self-esteem and yes, confidence. All of that. Yeah. Right, that's great to hear about these projects. Thank you so Thank very you much so for much coming for in to me. share with pleasure. us. Thank you Happy very day. much, Professor Claude and Madeline. Thank, Thank you. All right, now we are going to continue. We have more guests coming in, but I know that, um, that um, the delegates and participants are going to look forward to your presentations and, and sharing with us more about the programs, etc. that you have been very hands-on. Thank and, you and this, for your This afternoon we will have the workshop, Great. workshop together yes. and the, the participants can discuss about the issue in details. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sharing more information and that is happening at what time so that the viewers can uh, know? Start at one. At one. So, that is um, very soon now, so you might want to go get ready for that. Thank you very Thank much you once very again. Much. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you are going to continue to take this chair, yeah. Professor Thorsak, because we are going now to talk about um, prep programs yeah. in Thailand. Prep programs, we talked a lot about that pre exposure prophylaxis, and we're going to get the Thai context and see how things are. We're going to be joined by Kunbina Kuti Parambun from UNICEF Thailand. Let's welcome Kunbina. Sawadika. Sawadika. Do take a seat right here. Center stage right here. And Thank the spotlight you. spotlight is shining on us and we're we're excited to hear I'm about excited. about about the latest here in I Thailand. Think, I think she she is uh, one of the non not non MD. We call mm -hmm. non MD. Non -MD. Because <laughs> in the past day, I think you interview many professors yes. and doctors. Na? Very technical. But right now, and she is not. She is yeah. not doctor, but she helped a lot in the program. For, do you know prep? Do you know prep? We talked a lot about yeah, it. Yeah. Pre-exposure. Let me get the pronunciation yeah. correct here. Pre-exposure prophylaxis. Yes. Yeah. Right. Otherwise known as prep. prep. Yeah. yeah. And we are talking about oral prep. Mm -hmm. So it's the medication which you take for HIV prevention. Yes. But specifically, my topic here is to talk about prep for adolescents mm -hmm. because that's the knowledge gap which we find right now. Because prep for adults above 18 has been uh, in in the country and uh, mm -hmm. globally very actively right. there for HIV prevention. Mm -hmm. But for adolescents, the age group which is below 18, mm -hmm. it's not th there is a knowledge gap. So that's right. the gap which UNICEF yeah. is uh, because intending in, to fill. In general, when when you older age, I mean more than 18 years old, you can adjust. I mean you can decide to join or use prep. But for Thailand, if under 18, is you are you need a caregiver or parents to sign to or to, sign. to to give you a consent. And parents are not willing to sign. Some. some Hard, hard to say. Now, some adolescents, if, if they need prep, sometimes they don't tell. They cannot tell the, their parents because they're too shy. Or sometimes their parents don't want them to have like uh, sexual active. So they, sometimes it's secret. That is so very this, much this part of time. So this issue is uh huh. Uh huh. Right ah. now, from my understanding, prep works wonders. Yeah. But it's not for everyone. No. And it, and it's not going to be for that adolescent if the parent won't sign. Uh, it's it's that's why there, there is a knowledge gap mm -hmm. in that and there is no implementation right now globally available for us to readily look at it and say okay this works this way you can get consent or this way you need parental uh, consent so that's a knowledge gap UNICEF is intending to fill in to see what could be the right of the child and adolescent to accelerate that and what could be the policy shifts we can make in the country to accept. I mean, if you look at Thailand, as he rightly said, there need to be a consent for treatment be above, uh, below 18. Mm -hmm. But Thailand is one of the countries which opened up uh, consent uh, for HIV testing for children without uh, an adult uh, support. 
So a child who is below 18, if she, he or she understands what HIV testing and implication is, mm -hmm. a medical professional can offer test. So Thailand has really moved ahead with these kind of policy shifts. So we are looking at in that context what would be the best scenario to offer, as you are saying, the cutting edge technology of PrEP for prevention of HIV. Mm -hmm. That means in a country where adolescents are sexually active in a relatively early age and there is an HIV prevalence among specific target groups in the country. So if you want to reach uh, the goal of ending AIDS, we need to focus target on people who are at substantial risk of HIV. Mm -hmm. That means there is a group of people who may require PrEP who are below 80 mm -hmm. so that we can prevent them from getting the infection at the right time. Right. So that's what we are looking at in terms of implementing PrEP. So we'll have to head out to the schools and have uh, sex education. Not, not directly what, to school, no? in what the community. Measures? In the community. Yeah. So we need the support of, of media mm -hmm. to get yeah. the word out. And internet. Mm -hmm. Oh, social Inside, media yeah. works mm -hmm. very well mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So um, various organizations and people with key roles in this, how Absolutely. active are they? Because, I mean, sorry to say media is a two-edged sword, you know, and what we see on Thai television these days get kids, adolescents, even more curious and even, you know, more sexually active, we have to admit because of what we see. So that's why you need capacity in the country with the professional circuit, as I was saying, that's, that's a gap we need to fill in mm -hmm. because there is enough information online mm -hmm. and people are accessing PrEP uh, from elsewhere because you have the information available mm -hmm. and there are people whom we have met during our formative research stage where they have already accessed, but the issue is they don't have a complete information. They should use uh, the PrEP in a consistent manner at the period of risk. So there has to be a way of monitoring when they use, when they don't use, are they really averting the incidence of HIV. So this is very important to have a scientific way of implementing PrEP in partnership with, as you are saying, the community-based organizations who are working and reaching out to the community, to the children who are at risk of HIV. So we don't need to go to anybody and everybody. So it's only, as you initially said, it's only needed for people who really love everybody. Right. Very interesting indeed. And challenging. Because, Very, uh, extremely. Many, it is. many issues around adolescents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because adolescents are rapidly changing face. So yeah. they keep changing. Their needs keep changing. Their interests keep changing. So we need to be ahead of the game to be reaching out to adolescents maybe compared to adults who would be a little more traditional, who are happy to access, which is available. But then for adolescents, we need to package it in such a way that it is part of the adolescent service. Right now, we have very specific services for infants. If you look at globally, you have children, you have adults. But we kind of miss adolescents mm. who are a very critical phase mm -hmm. of life, mm -hmm. shifting to adulthood somehow in the whole gamut of our developmental program. So mm -hmm. that's what UNICEF is trying to bring in. So we are not looking at PrEP HIV as a standalone package, mm. but as a part of adolescents' health and well-being in the country. Right, because before this, um, I was hearing a lot about um, high-risk groups, mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. sex workers, being mm -hmm. gay men, but not so much this group that you are talking about that we're focusing on for this special segment here. And I am taking it that it's not just trying to get the info to these adolescents, but I think to parents, that's also yeah. so key, isn't it, and Professor the, Balsap? And this should update parents also, yes. very important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This should initiate a dialogue between parents and children, their sexuality, the importance of reaching out or giving them access to service at the right time. But I just would like to you know, stand corrected what you said in terms of whom do we reach out. Mm -hmm. So as I saying, it's not going to be anybody and everybody. Mm -hmm. So most of the people who would require PrEP would be also people who are sexually active and at risk of HIV. So if they have uh, safe behavior for HIV, yes. we don't yeah. need to reach them. So there could be young boys who have sex with 
That's uh, boys, mm -hmm. young men who have sex with men, mm -hmm. sex workers. So those who are at substantial risk of HIV. So that's very important to notice. So that's uh -huh. that's the key way. We don't want to go to anybody and everybody who are sexually active. So it has to be at risk of HIV to offer PrEP and there would be clear criteria who gets it. So that's very important for us to have in the protocol, in the guidelines which we hope to develop in the coming years with the support of Ministry of Public Health, High Red Cross, community-based organization, other UN organizations. So it's going to be a multi-partner, multi-centric program which we are trying to reach out in the country. You have ended that so well because collaboration, concerted effort, that is also key. Thank you so very much for joining us, Bina. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Thank thank you. you. Thank From you so UNICEF Thailand and continue to work hard to make it successful and, and to make these adolescents better understand parents etc. Good, good luck. Good luck. Good luck to you. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so very much. much. Thank you. All right. Now for the final part of our interview sessions live to you from the 19th Bangkok International Symposium on HIV Medicine. We are now going to look at data revolution, getting an overview there. And let's bring up now from UNAIDS Asia Pacific, Mr. Tofik Bakali. Sawadika. I'm so happy you're here with us. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. We're going to be talking about data. Now, earlier on, we had a guest sitting here, Ms. Irina Soretti, and um, she was saying that um, data is extremely important and sometimes there's not enough records or medical history going back, etc. Data is key, isn't it? Absolutely. How, how important? Give us an overview here. Data is the basis of ensuring the success of everything we are doing to respond to the HIV epidemic. Mm. Let me place this in context, which would be the focus of our discussion uh, with data. The, we have a very short window after the commitment of all the countries to achieve a fast track target between now and 2020 to achieve, to be able to really tackle the epidemic and curb the trends, being able to control the epidemic. Between now and 2020, we are already 2017, it's only three years. We need to act fast and we need information systems that allow us to know very fast and very quickly the real situations of what is happening with the epidemic. And also that allow us to uh, find out that we are reaching the right people with the right services in the right way and at the right time. That's too much. Mm. But that requires a complete shift of paradigm in terms of how we use data systems from the past versus the future. And that goes in line with the discussions that are ongoing right now in Durban around data for sustainable development mm -hmm. because we need to ensure that the, the response to HIV is sustainable. So the point here is uh, this, this data information systems need to respond to the epidemic and need to be the basis of all decision making. That requires that we shift from the past view of showcasing performance on aggregate level, like in this country, on this province, mm. we achieved 20%, 70%, 80%, towards more focus on the impact. Our impact is controlling the epidemic. Whatever we are doing, we need to make sure that it leads to contribution to control the epidemic in any way. That requires changing the information systems instead of transmitting aggregated numbers from the clinics to the provinces, to the states, to national level to report the numbers. That means we need to have an aggregate of individual level information. And that relates to the example that you have just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we do not have consistent availability of historical data about individuals across systems. Now, a person living with HIV does not necessarily have to go continuously to the same clinic for his tests, for go. his viral mm -hmm. load, for his treatment, for his drugs, and any other health issues he might have. It's Correct. Not, yeah. They're allowed to be mobile and travel. And yes. Uh -huh. The existing information systems do not allow to make the links for the same individual. Mm. Right? Because they aggregate numbers, not information on individuals. So that's the revolution that is required right now at this level, is to be able to have in the 21st century, uh, uh, in the 
that at this time of technology development and we have information systems and softwares, we are able to manage this information. We should be and able to. We should be. Correct. We are able. Yes. We have the capacities. It's just a little bit of investment and shift of paradigm and methodologies oh. of how to do it. The other aspect is, while we do all this, we need to keep looking at the gaps. Who is missing from our system and why? And how can we reach that person? Now, we've seen so many interesting presentations about how to achieve the clinical outcome on individual level. You can do this, you achieve this, and all it's based on data, evidence, but that's on clinical trials. You do not have the same kind of information at population level, at aggregated level, that tells us... You mean like the, the real clinical setting, right? Yes. The real life. Yes. Uh -huh. And this needs to be added as well with what we call operational research, okay. which is extremely, you just discussed PrEP mm -hmm. right now. Now we cannot just decide and say, okay, let us give PrEP to adolescents, mm. yeah, which is a need. But we need to know what is the acceptability of PrEP for adolescents. What is the right way to provide the service? And how to make sure that our intervention is efficient? We have existing interventions right now that are quite expensive. We have good coverage reaching the populations in need, but we do not have the expected effect in terms of behavior change or control in the epidemic, especially for the case of uh, men who have sex with men and other gay people. Everywhere in the region, we have the proportion of infections among MSM increasing everywhere, regardless of the trend of the epidemic. Either it's declining slowly or it's increasing, but why? We have good coverage, but we have never looked at the issue of effectiveness, that our intervention leads to the behavior change that we are looking for, right? Now, we have good examples with what is happening with PrEP, is that before we start the scale up of the rollout, we have uh, research uh, that provides us the evidence of the expected um, uh, that would guide expected model of intervention. How can we find out the people who is, per, who is uh, eligible to receive and who is more likely to accept? How can we set up the targets? How can we save the costs? And that's very important because at this time, the, the resources for HIV programs are either stable or declining everywhere. But we still need to reach much more people. The information needs to contain uh, cost elements that allows this analysis so that we can ensure that we not only um, achieve the effectiveness in terms of controlling the epidemic but also efficiency savings by controlling mm -hmm. the, the spendings, the amount of resources that are required to achieve more with less. Yeah. Wow. So all this, that's why we call it a revolution, is mm. a complete data shift. Uh, in terms of how we use information systems to inform public health programs. And that change is what we will be uh, discussing so, a little so bit in this session. Like you are planning to do the big database for the global, right? Or, or, you, or you have it already, or you, you are planning? It's, planning it's, it's, it's being built now. Being the, built. Data, the data is owned by the country, and we have several issues around confidentiality, security of information. Sure. These are people, and we know the levels of stigma and discrimination, we need to ensure all this. But it is important that the assessment of results is built based on an aggregation of individual results. So this requires a large database anyway. Some countries are already investing. UNAIDS and the partners, WHO and other, uh, other partners are supporting countries in the wind that, uh, uh, that process. Some countries have stepped ahead mm -hmm. of everyone mm. even before we started this discussion because they reached the point um, needing that kind of thinking and that yes. kind of investment to, right. um, yeah, to guide their, their interventions and Thailand is one of them. Great and we will continue to speed ahead in terms of that and then um, we will be a good role model for others to Definitely. follow suit so that we reach that level. And we need role model for others to uh, yes, follow. for sure. Thank you so very much. Thank Joining you. us here from UNAIDS Asia Pacific, Mr. Taufik Bakali. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice talking to you.
lovely. That's um, in depth, really. Data revolution, and it all sounds very exciting, very beneficial, useful indeed. And I would like to thank you as well, Dr. Tho Sak Punu Purata. A researcher at HIVNAT of the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center, pediatrician as well for joining me here. Thank you. And I'd like to thank all the see viewers you in the joining. Workshop. Yes, okay. I'll see you in the workshop bye bye. and looking forward to that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and that's going to wrap up today's live interviews with the experts regarding the latest in HIV research, treatment, and much, much more. Join us again tomorrow for more live interviews with the experts as part of the 19th Bangkok International Symposium on HIV Medicine. I'm Pachori Raksa Wong saying bye-bye for now. So I think